Okay. Para ter certeza que vai dar tudo certinho, gente, eu já comecei a transmissão, então nós já estamos no ar. Só para avisar aos que estão chegando que nós estamos aguardando só mais uns minutos a professora Francesca, e que em minutos nós começamos, tá bom? Nós estamos no ar, só para eu... Todos vocês estão aparecendo lá, é isso mesmo, né? Acho que nesse começo sim, mas depois a gente pode deixar só a mesa, já, pra, acho que para todo mundo ficar mais confortável. Eu estou sem som, então eu também vejo a gente. Acho que já está transmitindo normal. Para quem está chegando no canal, nós estamos só aguardando alguns minutinhos a professora Francesca. É, em minutos, nós começamos a conferência da aula inaugural do PPGHIU. Tchau, Francesca. Hello. Hi, Francesca. Okay, hello. Welcome. Hi. I'm gonna have to prepare my... ...screen. So maybe you can, um, I think you need to authorize me to share my screen. Just a minute. 
Okay. Podemos começar? David? Sim. Sejam todos bem-vindos, bem-vindas à nossa aula inaugural do PPGHI UFO. Uh, hoje estamos recebendo a professora Francesca Trivelato com a palestra História Global e Microanálise Revisitadas. Uh, nós damos início com essa aula inaugural a várias coisas, ao ano letivo, nós damos boas-vindas aos alunos que estão chegando, nós desejamos um bom ano letivo para os alunos que já são veteranos, mas também é, nós queremos inaugurar uma nova fase do PPGHI, é, que passou pela sua reestruturação no final de 2020, é, e estamos todos muito felizes com essa nova, com essa nova etapa é, do programa de pós-graduação em História da Universidade Federal de Uberlândia. É, desde já, fico muito feliz com os que já estão aqui assistindo a palestra conosco, que vão acompanhar essa aula inaugural, Queria convidá-los a visitarem tanto o nosso site, que está remodelado, quanto a nossa presença nas redes sociais, no Instagram, no Facebook, nos canais uh, do PPGHI UFO, e também agradecer pelos inscritos nesse nosso canal no YouTube, que também é uma estreia, e eu acho que é um imenso orgulho para todos nós poder contar com a professora Francesca Trivelato como a, a, a palestrante que inaugura o nosso canal, que seja um canal uh, bastante produtivo para o programa, que nós possamos compartilhar as nossas pesquisas, trocar experiências, as nossas, os nossos eventos acadêmicos pelo canal, Uh, tenho tentado interagir, uh, meu nome é Ana Flávia Senic Ramos, eu sou a coordenadora do programa, a nova coordenadora do programa, uh, eu tenho tentado interagir com uh, todos os alunos e a comunidade acadêmica pelas redes sociais, uh, e já fico uh, bastante feliz por começar essa minha gestão uh, com esse evento. A gente vai, a dinâmica da... Uh, então, eu queria agradecer também ao professor Dave, que fez o contato com a professora Francesca Trivelato, que vai mediar a mesa, a presença dos professores que integram o colegiado, a professora Carla Miucci, a professora Alexandra Vilar, o, o professor Jean Neves. Uh, e eu queria também uh, dizer que nós passamos um formulário de inscrição para os que desejassem... Uh, participar da palestra e receber um certificado ao final de presença, nós ao longo da palestra passaremos essa lista uh, para depois emitir os certificados, nós teremos a seguinte dinâmica, o professor Dave fará uma apresentação da palestrante, da professora Francisca Trivelato, em seguida ela ministrará a sua conferência e depois a gente vai abrir para as perguntas e faremos as perguntas em blocos. Eu vou ficar responsável por no, Facebook, por no YouTube anotar as perguntas, daqueles que se interessarem pode mandar pelo chat, que eu estou acompanhando por lá também. E, mais uma vez, agradecer a presença de todos. Eu vou passar a palavra ao professor Dave. Francesca, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, e, Dave, por favor, eu passo a palavra. Bem-vindo, Francesca. Uh... Hoje nós contamos então com a presença da professora Francesca Trivelato, que vai trabalhar um pouco com a gente hoje essa relação entre o micro e o macro dentro de um contexto de história global. Eu vou falar um pouco com a professora agora de como será um pouco a nossa dinâmica. Francesca, eu parlo adesso sulla tua trajetória e parlerò um pouco, mas só um pouco del tuo libro Familiaridade entre Estranhos. Allora sua, uh, sarà tua lezione e alle fine io, io farò alcune domande e poi passo alle domande degli studenti, va bene? Eu entendo bem o português, falo uh, o inglês, falo muito mal o italiano, mas a gente consegue se comunicar por aqui. Uh, então, boa tarde a todos e a todas. Contamos hoje com a presença da professora Francesca Trivelato, historiadora italiana, a quem agradeço muito por ter aceito o meu convite. A professora Francesca tem uma trajetória muito interessante, uh, ela é formada em História pela uh, Universidade Cafoscari de Veneza uh, e ela fez 
doutorado na Universidade Luiz de Bocconi, em Milano, e uh, também fez um segundo doutorado na Brown University, nos Estados Unidos. A trajetória acadêmica dela é praticamente toda nos Estados Unidos. Então, ela há mais de 10 anos, uh, ela foi professora por mais de 10 anos na Universidade de Yale, e desde 2018 ela é professora uh, na Escola de Estudos Históricos do Instituto de Estudos Avançados em Princeton, nos Estados Unidos. Uh, a professora Francesca é autora de uma dezena de artigos e capítulos de livros, muitos deles, a maioria deles, relacionados a trocas culturais e econômicas, sobretudo uh, de comerciantes judeus em escala transnacional. Ela é autora de três livros premiados, que, a meu ver, hoje em dia são referências obrigatórias no debate sobre as potencialidades uh, da história global, sobretudo da história conectada, e também sobre o desenvolvimento recente da microhistória enquanto método, né? Uh, o primeiro livro dela é o Fundamenta dei Vetrai, uh, que está em, tá em italiano, sobre os fabricantes de vidro e objetos de vidro em Veneza. O segundo é o Familiarity uh, of Strangers, que acabou de receber uma tradução em português pela edição 70 de Portugal, está disponível aqui no Brasil também, para quem quiser adquirir. Uh... Tem traduções em inglês, uh, ele foi escrito em inglês, tem traduções em, em japonês, italiano e francês. E o último livro da Francesca é o uh, Promise and, uh, The Promise and Perry of Credit, que, tá, que tem essa tradução uh, em inglês e tem tradução também prevista para o italiano e para o francês. Nos últimos anos, vários historiadores ligados à perspectiva da microhistória empenharam-se em oferecer algumas respostas né, para algumas limitações epistemológicas da história global, sobretudo pela tendência, ou sobretudo a tendência generalizante pouco empírica dessa, desse, desse ramo historiográfico. Né? E a Francesca Trivelato talvez tenha sido aquela que mais contribuiu, empiricamente falando, para essa interação entre microhistória e história conectada, né? O livro que hoje, de alguma maneira, é, é, faz parte da apresentação dela, né, o Familiaridade entre Estranhos, é um dos melhores trabalhos a utilizar essas potencialidades da microhistória para tentar resolver problemas ou responder questões típicas da história global. Em suma, ela argumenta como conceber a relação analítica adequada entre as escalas micro e macro e se pergunta como a gente pode se apropriar das abordagens sincrônicas típicas da microhistória para realizar análises diacrônicas, típicas da história global, sem sacrificar o conhecimento de objetos singulares em prol de generalizações. Para resolver os problemas epistemológicos da história global, né, e sobretudo da história conectada, que é o que a professora Francesca faz com mais brilhantismo, né, ela propõe a apropriação de dois caminhos desenvolvidos pelos pais da microhistória. Em primeiro lugar, é a perspectiva do Giovanni Levi, que ele desenvolveu na herança imaterial, né? ou seja, a coleta sistemática de dados com o intuito de que as ações e crenças individuais dos atores sociais possam ser colocadas em relações com as crenças de parentes, vizinhos, conhecidos, superiores hierárquicos e daí por diante. Em um segundo lugar, ela adota também, mas uh, um pouco mais distante, da perspectiva do Carlo Ginzburg, né, que lança a mão em vários de seus trabalhos de um distanciamento progressivo de um texto singular, na forma de poder identificar ecos e filiações através de uma série de textos selecionados que seriam relacionados a tradições culturais diversas, aquilo que o Ginsburg chama de logosforma. Então foi essa abordagem que a Francesca construiu em seu estudo de um conjunto de mercadores judeus sediados na cidade portuária de Livorno, na Toscana, e sua extensa rede comercial construída na primeira metade do século XVIII. Nessa pesquisa, ela procura mais do que restaurar a agência de um grupo oprimido ou jogar luz sobre as rotas comerciais desse grupo. O background do seu trabalho é nos apresentar o papel da cultura e das instituições na ascensão do capitalismo comercial europeu, do micro para o macro, através da análise de múltiplas conexões. Trivelato demonstra, então, empiricamente, como a vida e as estratégias econômicas dos judeus de Livorno, tinham ao mesmo tempo uma dimensão global e local. Segundo ela, o local e o global não podem ser concebidos por meio de uma série de círculos concêntricos, ordenados e hierar hierarquicamente, se expandindo do menor para o maior. As alianças familiares, a diáspora, o Mediterrâneo, os oceanos Atlântico e Índico, outras comunidades mercantis, 
e a economia política dos estados. Todos esses elementos, sim, estão interconectados um aos outros de forma simultânea. E o que é mais importante, uh, nenhum deles oferece um contexto explicativo a priori. Assim, não importa qual a direção, para qual direção rumo a história global, pode-se dizer que persistem uh, o problema da definição de contexto e de qual o significado que esse contexto tinha para os atores do passado. Reflexões típicas, eu acho, uh, da primeira geração da microhistória. Então, Francesca, bem-vinda. Uh, passo a palavra para você. A Francesca entende um pouco de português. Estudou os judeus portugueses de Livorno, né? Sefarditas. Então, eu passo a palavra para você, Francesca. Fique à vontade. A aula é sua. Ah, boa tarde. Estou muito obrigada por este convite. Eu gostaria de poder fazer minha palestra em português, mas ah, felizmente, Dave. É, preparou algumas traduções para você nas slides. É, uma, mais ou menos como entender o português, a falar é uh, muito complicado. Uh, so, thank you very, very much. And um, let me start. Global history in its current iteration began in the 1990s. This is when, for example, the Journal of World History was created. Of course, scholarly interest in, the universal, in universal history dates back to antiquity and exists in a great many civilizations and a variety of international, imperial, colonial, and transnational histories have been part of the academic study of the past since its modern beginning. But I'm concerned here with something more specific, although not so specific that I can define it for you from the onset of my lecture. A dilemma that, as you will see, is integral to my inquiry into social history, excuse me, into global history. I need to stress that my remarks are those of a historian of early modern Europe who works in the United States and who, although more interested in peripheries than in centers, lacks the linguistic skills to ventures beyond the borders of Western Europe and its empires in her research. It must be added that in this field of early modern European history and its empire, Some of the work that global history is doing today was once the responsibility of the label early modernity itself. The expression early modern took off slowly in the Anglophone academia beginning in the 1940s with a twin goal, to replace the Renaissance, Baroque, Enlightenment periodizing sequence while also offering an antidote to its Eurocentrism. Already in the 1970s, the historian of China and Central Asia, Joseph Flesher, outlined the possibility of what he called an integrative history centered on parallels and interconnections that would have occurred across Eurasia in the early modern period defined as 1500 to 1800. Since then, we have witnessed two bold attempts to carry out Fletcher's program, as in Victor Lieberman's study of state formation in East and Southeast Asia with a European and global comparative angle, updates to Fletch Fletcher's program in light of notions of connective rather than comparative histories, The launch of the in 1997 of the Journal of Early Modern History, which is subtitled Context, Comparisons, Contrasts, Early Modernity Viewed from a World Historical Perspective, and the flourishing of endless debates about the pertinence and limits of the label Early Modernity. The more recent boom of books, articles, chapters, dissertations, and blogs inspired by global history seems to me to raise at least three questions. 
First, when is global history a topic, as in the study of globalization? When is it a theme or an angle, as in the rejection of national or local history? And when does it instead imply a specific methodology? Second, what are the implications of attributing a global reorientation of one's own research topics to current geopolitics, biographical experiences, or new sensitivities toward the non-West, which we have finally realized is most of the world rather than the rest of the world, especially for those of us trained as historians of early modern Europe. Third and finally, what, in what ways does a global approach affect the relationship between micro and macro analysis, which long predates global history in its recent instantiation, and which has informed many landmark historical and sociological works. Perhaps the greatest challenge in taking up these questions is that the meaning of global history is amorphous. The expression encompasses multiple approaches, some of which are even difficult to reconcile with one another, ideologically or methodologically. Most writing in the guise of global history does not cover the entire globe, that's for sure. To say global history often hints at something, but not something precise. Among academics on the left, the label stands for a rejection of nationalism and nativism, and in some cases for more inclusive classroom teaching and less sectorial hiring practices. But all implicit understandings remain in flux. There are some authors who write quasi-apologetic writings of the uh, studies of the British empires that are sometimes presented as global history, which would be a very different sort of the one I just evoked. Some specialists of the post 1800, which is different from what I will cover in this, uh, in this uh, uh, lecture, but should be mentioned. In the post 1800, some specialists uh, display a preference for the term international history to designate the study of hard, topics like diplomacy, political economy, and military history, and reserve global for so-called softer themes, such as human rights, migration, material culture, and the like. But even this distinction is not set in stone. So Harvard has a very important global history initiative that sponsor a lot of talks about hard topics. All in all, it is virtually impossible to detect a single methodological strand that can be associated with global history. In this respect, we are facing a very distinct phenomenon, something entirely different from the school movements and so-called turns that have shaped the Western historiography of the 20th century, and a trait that we need to put front and center of our analysis, no matter how disorienting it might be. Admits a great deal of confusion, one thing seems certain. Global history puts pressure on the brightest and the darkest spots of the historical profession, at least as practice in Europe and North America. I say puts pressure because for some it has not done enough, while for others it has already done a great deal, if not too much, to dismantle the status quo. With expected time lags, demographic changes in the college age population drive curricular reform and the research agenda of historians and doctoral programs. In the United States, by 2060, Non-whites, if we include non-Hispanic among them, will be the majority of the total population. According to the data gathered by the American Historical Association, which is the professional association of all historians in the United States, since the beginning 
beginning of the 21st century, world history has been the fastest growing field in departments of history in the United States. You see, this is the curve of what these, the I'm not debating here what is global history, what is world history. I'm taking the terminology used by the survey done by the American Historical Association. So world history has been the fastest growing field in departments of history in the United States, although this growth has likely been more rapid in large state universities where former West civilization courses have been replaced by world history surveys rather than in elite colleges and research universities where niche classes are still taught. But data gathered by the same uh, American Historical Association also show that the erosion of European and US history in the past 40 years, as judged by the fields of specialization of those teaching in these departments, has been slow and predictably more pronounced in European than in US history. That means that when somebody retires who's a US historian is replaced with somebody who also does European, uh, US history, when somebody retires in European history, less so, and there are more people hired to teach Latin American history, Asian uh, history, and so forth. But you can tell uh, that certainly national history has not precipitously been abandoned, and that's usually the truth in every country. Overall, this evidence suggests that Pache political pundits who fault academic elites for being to the left of the general population, the growth of world history is largely demand-driven rather than the result of top-down liberal engineering and has and has hardly erased more traditional areas of instruction and research. In 2017, Jeremy Edelman, a scholar of Latin America, including Brazil, which is certainly known to many of you for his work, as well as the director of the Global History Lab at Princeton University, captured the mood of many in a provocative and widely read online essay that mused on the rapid rise and seemingly imminent decline of global history. In the wake of Donald Trump electoral victory and backlashes against globalization the world over, Edelman warned that, quote, global historians seemed out of step with their times. He sounded a cautionary note to have a future, global history must cease to feed usable pasts to elite advocates and consumers of globalization and should instead expose the limits of connections, mobility, fusion, oneness, in forging a more interdependent and compassionate world. His aim, as I understood it, it was not to issue a death certificate for a global history, but to call for greater awareness about the academy's pull toward a global bricolage that antedated our multiple makeups, multicultural makeups, at a time when, quote, a powerful political movement arose against globalism. And I dare to say that your country have firsthand experience of this rather tragic political movement. This seemingly reasonable warning, however, sounded an alarm among those who read it as a disengagement from someone for some of the, from some of the thorniest issues of the day by someone who as a senior faculty member at a very elite US institution, admittedly enjoys the opportunity to retreat into any research topic of his choosing. Writing from the limbo of the United Kingdom during the post-Brexit referendum, Richard Drayton, a historian of the British Empire in the Caribbean at King's, and King's College London, and David Mudadell, an international historian of the London School of Economics, also in London, took issues with Edelman's vision. 
that reminded everyone that national history is and remains the dominant form of historical inquiry with, quote, token Africanists and Middle Easterners as to represent the histories of entire regions over millennia in most history departments in Europe and North America. They also argue that not all global history is concerned with mobility and connections, given the attention that some literature written under that rubric has drawn on imperial violence, the resistance to globalization, and the bumpiness of, of globalization. Both sides in this polarized exchange score some important points. Dayton, Drayton and Modadel are absolutely correct in pointing out the continued primacy of national history, as well as, this, as, well as the nostalgic and defensive postures of many historians who command considerable respect, especially in the traditional media. At the same time, there is no denying that the global trot, the kind of globe trotters who are the protagonists of several so-called global microhistory, who took place in the early modern period, for example, represented the upper crust of their respective societies, the lucky few with the means and the opportunity to embark in voluntary travel, be it for leisure, curiosity, religious zeal, or profit ventures. And that they sort of, we try to, those of us who belong to a certain kind of intellectual and uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, upper crust of our uh, communities may imagine ourselves in those global chapters of the early modern period. In the wake of the global coronavirus pandemic that has made local, national, and international structural inequalities impossible to deny, a group of doctoral students at the university, at the European University Institute, which is located just outside of Florence, have published a white paper in open access that puts a militant spin on several positions expressed or implied by Edelman, Drayton, and Murdadel. They find themselves utterly disappointed and, I'm quoting, with the impression that competition rather than collaboration, gatekeeping rather than inclusion, dominate not just academic production, but also academic debate in global history. They feel that global history written partially or primarily from the margin would foster a very different culture of debate. And they call, quote, more, se more senior global historians to build a truly multipolar and multilingual academic network in which historians from outside of the United States and Europe can participate on equal footing, freed from the current, quote, hierarchies of dominance and sometimes oppression. It's, it, it's, it's a paper full of pathos. As they express their resentment against what they call the Anglosphere, the authors of the EUI paper also state openly, and this is quite striking, quote, that there is nothing canonical about global history. Indeed, since its establishment in 2009, the EUI Global History Seminar has altered so dramatically that not a single reading from the 2009 syllabus is on the syllabus for the 2020. I find this a rather strikingly and very interesting fact. If not unheard of, it is at least peculiar, and some may say a reflection of the dominant liberal ordering which we live, to witness such a discrepancy between the strong intellectual and emotional reactions that global history generates and the lack of clarity of its definition. Nor is the young EUI group alone in producing this dissonance. The new editorial team of the Journal of Global History asserts that, quote, the varied contributions of today's global history all share a transgressive impulse, these are their words, insofar as they transcend the boundaries of what currently pass 
for the, for the established fields and disciplines. But having affirmed that, quote, what distinguishes global history is its concern for crafting new concepts and methods to crystallize aspects of the past which would otherwise remain obscure or elusive, end of quote, the editors provide no examples of such concepts or methods. Sensing a mismatch between polemical tones and analytical clarity, I turn to a scholar who has a characteristically sharp and generous ability to distill historiographical trends as they unfold under our eyes. In her writing history in the global era, Lynn Hunt identifies four major paradigms of historical research in the post-World War II era, Marxist modernization, the Annal School, and in the United States especially, identity politics. These are her words. She used the word paradigm with explicit reference to the definition offered in 1962 by the noted historian of science, Thomas Kuhn, the process through which scientific communities establish and then revoke a consensus on research questions and the methods through which they address them. For Hunt, a more globally oriented history today represents a new paradigm, one that might work well serve to encourage a sense of international citizenship or belonging to the world and not just to one's own nationality, she writes, even if she's careful to know that this outcome is as yet far more of a promise than a reality. A paradigm, Hunt reminds us, is an overarching account or meta narrative of historical development that includes one, a hierarchy of factors that determine meaning, and two, an agenda for research. So how is a more globally oriented history, she advocates a paradigm in the same way as the other four she identifies, Marxist modernization theory, the Annal School and identity politics. None of the methodological coherence or even the belligerence to our alternative methods that characterize the other paradigms she singles out hold global history together. Global history comes in a wide assortment of styles ranging from synthetic and Western centric contributions to explicit rejections of such synthesis as well as detailed studies of transnational, transregions, regional connections set in distant corners of the earth. Following Hunt's own definition, I would conclude that global history is a lot of things. Sometimes it is incredibly creative, but it is not a paradigm. In what follows, I review some of the creative approaches to global history that have gone a long way toward dethroning the West from the paragon of all comparisons that it once was. I pay special attention to those studies that have used microanalysis in order to produce new generalizations. And that echoes um, the very kind introduction that uh, Davy, uh, Davy uh, gave and uh, the work that I did, but also I'll talk about others as well. We'll begin with some works on the Great Divergence. One of the most influential books written by a historian of the 21st century also goes further than any other I know in combining micro and macro analysis in the service of comparative history. This is Kenneth Pomeranz, 2000, The Great Divergence, China, Europe, and the Making of the Modern World Economy. It subjects England and the Yangtze Delta region to a series of balanced comparisons. So it doesn't put, it doesn't say this is Europe, how does China compare it to it? It put them on a balanced comparisons from which several surprising similarities in agriculture, 
commercial and proto-industrial development emerge as late as 1750. For Pomeranz, these resemblance are the result of global conjunctures stemming from the existence of a polycentric world with no dominant center as late as 1800. The great divergence in his chronology begins around 1800. The book famously argues that the Industrial Revolution occurred in England rather than in China, not because of advantages accumulated over centuries, but because of the two reasons. One, the accidental proximity of coal to manufacturing plants in England. There was coal in China, but it was far away and the cost of transporting was too high. And secondly, because of British control of slave labor and captive markets in the Caribbean. Chance and violence rather than ingenuity, puritanism, and representative political institutions were that the other roots of modern economic growth. This is very radical thesis. What is interesting is the method. To reach these conclusions, Pomeranz relies on an impressive variety of secondary sources from which he extracts fine-grained key economic indicators ranging from demography, demography to luxury goods consumptions, employment, deforestations, and most controversially, standards of living. The Great Divergence has been criticized for a number of reasons, also not, although none to my knowledge has discussed at length the extent to which it wrestles with how to mobilize microanalysis in the order to marshal a new macro pictures. Can we compare peasants' family budgets from the 1920s and 30s, the earliest one that survived in China, with those from pre-industrial England? How do we square the fact that in Pomeranz's model, the ghost acres are a residual category with the fact that in a widely held consensus among economic historians of Britain, there is no statistical evidence for a causal relation between returns on investments in the Caribbean and the Industrial Revolution in England. Here, part of the problem is also a chronological slippage in the sense that British colonialism in the Atlantic began in the 16th century, and although the slave trade reached its peak in the 18th century, you know, the, 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 the longer uh, uh, chronological arc favors the gradualist thesis that Pomeranz aims to counter. Finally, the state is altogether absent from his account. And this is the point on which another book, uh, Before and Beyond Divergence, The Politics of Economic Change in China and Europe, published in 2011 by Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, an economist with a long experience in French archives, and Roy Bing Wong, a historian of China who together with Pomeranz spearheaded the revisionist approach to the great divergence intervened. And incidentally, I want to call your attention to the fact that this book is testament to the importance of cross-disciplinary co-authorship uh, something very important to writing uh, first-class global history, but often undervalued by university deans, especially for um, colleagues uh, in the humanities at the beginning of their career. I don't know in Brazil, but certainly in the United States, for those who are lucky to get a tenure track uh, uh, position, it's very difficult to have a co-author group uh, uh, book uh, in the humanities to, to be evaluated as part of a tenure track uh, position. And also an issue that very strangely, the um, EUI Global History Seminar Group did not take up. I think that, that if I were young, that would be something that uh, uh, would uh, animate me. Um, and something that Lynn Hunt notes uh, in her book, she stresses how important co-authorship is to write uh, uh, a truly first-class uh, uh, global history, particularly because of the range of linguistic um, expertise that is needed. Rosenthal and Wong are significantly more comfortable with deductive thinking and the asymmetry of empirical evidence that plagues most comparisons between Chinese and European economic systems than Pomeranz. 
As a result, their way of integrating microdata in the macro picture is also more selective and top down. They outline falsifi falsifiable theories, that is, plausible scenarios that can be tested by others. Um, in their explanation of the great divergence, overseas colonial plantations play no role whatsoever. Instead, the difference in Asian and European political scales, that is the sheer vastness of ter and territorial contiguity of the Chinese empire, in contrast to the fragmentation of the European continent, warfare strategies and patterns of urbanizations are decisive and begin to matter a long time before the 18th century. So they're more gradualist and they emphasize um, you know, political economy, essentially. Still, these structural differences do not take Europe as their point of departure. Thus, Rosenthal and Wong highlight that it would be wrong, for example, to consider China's public finance backward because the empire's agrarian economy did not require the creation of a public debt. Similarly, they stress that, the Ch that Chinese merchants could count on the existence of the same legal system them across very long distances, which accounts for their greater reliance of informality, why the number of political borders, tariffs, and jurisdictions the merchants had to cross even within short distances in Europe made them dependent on legal instruments and authorities much more. Ultimately, Rosenthal and Wang's contribution entails a greater level of generalities than Pomerantz, but complements the latter's approach to comparative history by articulating a very important point. Different societies can develop different solutions to the same problem, but they may also face different problems and therefore develop different institutions. Their work is closer to how social scientists and historians address today their relationship between particularities and generalities, but we may recall that hypothesis testing has been, has been a central feature to comparative history since the time of Mark Bloch. And there's a splendid uh, article by William Sewell on this subject. Now coming to microhistory, which I know is a favorite of Davy. Even when their research focused on singular figures or episodes, Italian microhistorians who pioneered their approach in the 1970s never relinquished their search for generalizations, be it in the form of empirical regularities or new questionnaires, a distinction to which I will return. They had no intention of exalting the small, the local, the specific, as such. Rather, they gravitated toward a micro scale of analysis with the ambition of unseating existing narrative, if not also paradigms. But unlike Pomerantz and others who put micro level observation in the service of global comparisons, for the most part, they confine their studies to an individual or a local or regional dimension. At least one leading Italian microhistorian, however, wrote what retrospectively can be qualified as a veritable global microhistory. Carlo Ginsburg Exorcist Deciphering the Witch's Sabbath, or in Italian, Storia Notturna, una decifrazione del Sabba, which was published in 1989. It begins as from an investigation of the medieval European mindset and repressive apparatus that led to the belief that witches gather to perform a certain set of rituals and traces the existence of analogous ideas across Eurasia during the prior millennia. Exorcist completed the trilogy on witchcraft and pagan agrarian cults that Ginsburg inaugurated in 1966 with Benandanti in English Night Battles, which was followed by the hugely successful Informaggi Vermi, The Cheese and the Worms. 
The latter two studies are set in Friuli, the northern eastern region of Italy. They posed a question of how to go from highly specific, perhaps unique cases, to general conclusions concerning the culture of a largely illiterate population, a problem that in this case is compounded by the fact that the historian's access to peasant culture, peasants' culture is filtered through documents penned by Catholic inquisitors intent on suppressing that very culture, which challenged Catholic orthodoxy. In Exodus, by contrast, as Ginsburg wrote reflecting on it 30 years after its publication, he traveled in spirit from Friuli to Siberia. The book roams across Central Asia and reaches all the way to China, covering a dazzling variety of topics, types of evidence, text and authors from Herodotus to Evlidius Celebi, Bernardino of Siena, the Taoist philosopher Ko Hong, Philip Melanchthon, the, the Grimm brothers, to cite only a few. Exorcist is arguably one of the least read of Ginsburg's many works, although when it appeared nearly simultaneously in Italian, English, and French, it was widely discussed and often criticized within the scholarly community. It is dense, and difficult to absorb, but is also worth revisiting today in relation to debates about global microhistory because it is methodologically antithetical to most works that have recently been labeled as global microhistory and then often claim inspiration from Italian microhistory. It is not centered on one individual and it is the least narrative of Ginsburg trilogy, if not of its entire oeuvre. Exorcist embraces a capacious, very capacious geographical and temporal scope by following step-by-step step the clues, that's Ginsburg's famous word, left in documents examined as part of a very deeply local inquiry. It is therefore fully consistent with and a logical continuation of, rather than a departure from Ginsburg's earlier microanalytical work. But its global scale, in my view, also requires some innovations. I think Ginsburg described it as a continuum of his methods. I think there is some departure from his earlier methods. The first part of the book is comparative, although not in any fashion resembling the top-down framework adopted by scholars of the Great Divergence. Ginsburg analyzes the medieval per persecution of Jews, lepers, Muslims, and witches alongside one another, drawing analogies between them based on the treatment of these socially marginal groups as it's portrayed in the discourse produced by the oppressive majority regimes, mostly in Northern Italy and France. Pomerantz, by contrast, resembles Fernand Brodel more than any Italian microhistorians in his search for every possible evidentiary fragment that might be woven together in a large tapestry. In the second and third parts of Exorcist, then, Ginsburg moves away from the Italian peninsula and France and sets comparative history aside in favor of morphology as the tool with which to incorporate cultural themes and practices from other regions and periods, which sprung independently from the medieval belief in the Sabbath, but appear to be congruent with it. Following the traces of the witch's Sabbath away from the periods and regions that he knows best, Ginsburg expresses confidence in the possibility of identifying empirical regularities starting from the study of anomalous cases, other, you know, studying the study of anomalous cases, which is what he had started from when he was studying Friuli. Now, what is morphology? Morphology is uh, used in the life sciences, in linguistics, in art history, and in other disciplines, 
in order to explain the apparent similarities between forms and ideas that have been conceived autonomously from one another. But morphology, as some critics have noted, is predicated on a recognition of similarities that can be very subjective, if not even born out of limited knowledge of the subject. A colleague of mine has written an essay by wondering whether it is when we do not know very much, we see similarities, whether when we know a lot, we don't see similarities. Others, notably literary theorists and cultural anthropologists associated with post-colonial studies, emphasize radical differences that a morphological approach risks obliterating. The sati in India is sort of the famous paradigmatic case of radical differences in the famous essay by Gayatri Spivak, Can Subaltern Speak? I shall return to recent responses to these criticisms by some scholars that are inspired by Italian microhistory. But here, I think two considerations are in order regarding Storia Notturna. First, morphology was not part of the analytical toolkit that Ginsburg deployed to the, decipher freely popular culture. So I do think that it's interesting that there is something that, need, that the global scale requires. And second, writing in the wake of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the entro uh, the morphological unit of the cult of the dead that Ginsburg uncovered coincided with Eurasia, the very region that the Cold War had torn apart, and that was its global perimeter. If scholars of the great divergences reach globalization through a top down comparative approach that incorporates microanalysis, and Ginsburg argues for the generaliza generalizability of microhistorical cases across time and space. Other Italian microhistorians, as Davy noted or in his presentation, notably Giovanni Levi, advocate a different route to generalizations, arguing that microanalysis should lead to new generalizable questions rather than to generalized answers. And this is the version of microhistory that I drew inspirations from in my work on trade diasporas in order to test long held and polarizing views of the organization of private merchants in the pre-industrial period. Not only was in the pre-industrial period the concept of equality before the law unknown, but transportation systems and information networks were far weaker than after the introduction of the steamship or the railroads and the use of the telegraph for commercial purposes. And there existed no interstate system of legal enforcement or arbitration. The focus on a single partnership of Sephardic Jews based in Livorno in the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, which was a Catholic state, and in Aleppo in the Ottoman Empire, this was a partnership with had both, which had uh, two branches during the first four decades of the 18th century, allowed me to verify the extent to which in this technologically and legally fragile environment, religious discrimination matter in the formation of business alliances. On the basis of an extraordinary paper trail left behind by this partnership consisting uh, primarily of, of commercial letters, I was able to document that these Sephardic merchants defied the two prevailing models of conducting long distance trade outlined by the existing literature. They neither traded solely with other Jews, following Philip Curtin's dictum that at the time, quote, trade at a distance required a kinsman or at least a trusted fellow countryman to act as agent nor could they rely on the mediation of fair and affordable courts when they enter into selective but durable credit relations with non-Jews, whether Catholics in Lisbon or Hindus in Portuguese India, where they had to fear the power of the Inquisition. 
this is a map of uh, their uh, correspondence and uh, um, I should uh, uh, do a little shout out to a conference that Davy and some of his uh, colleagues are organizing at the end of uh, May. It's the fourth international seminar of microhistory and they kindly invited me to present uh, a familiaridad sobre stranger, stranger. And so on May 27, I'll be talking about this map and this book in much more detail. Um, unfortunately, it's still in English, but um, I have a month and a half to, I don't think I can do better, but, uh, um, but I'll be um, happy to talk in more detail about the Portuguese empire and the role of uh, both Jews and new Christians in it. Only by reducing the scale of analysis and examining the relationship that one family firm entertained with a diverse assortment of private and state actors was I able to bring these patterns to the fore? This individual case, which I also compared to a few others on the basis of both archival and secondary sources, generated important questions that I argue debunk the model of what Philip Corton called trade diasporas. Pioneering as Corton's, Corton's work was, it flattened the differences between mercantile groups in the interest of creating a less Eurocentric framework for world history. The Armenian diaspora of the early modern period features prominently in Curtin's book. In fact, once we open the black box of the most proactive segments of the Jewish and Armenian merchant communities during the 17th and 18th centuries, both of which operated across all regions of the globe, we find that they differed in many respects in their demographic size, their spatial configurations, the autonomy of their internal monitoring institutions, their status as religious minorities in the regions where they live, and their connections to sovereign powers. I use in particular, in order to do my comparisons between the Sephardic merchants I studied, and the, um, I use particularly the work of Sebu Aslanian, who teaches at UCLA, um, and uh, who wrote this book about the global trade networks of Armenian merchants from New Jolfa. New Jolfa was um, a neighborhood of the Iranian, the Southern Iranian city of Isfahan um, uh, and uh, from where the most proactive group of Armenians exported uh, the very prized product of raw, it, uh, excuse me, raw Iranian uh, silk. And so uh, the name uh, Jalfan Armenians come from the fact that they were based in new uh, Jalfa. They had been forcibly resettled there by the Shah, a lot were killed. And then once there, they were given a lot of, those who survived and were uh, allowed to live there uh, were given uh, considerable economic privileges and uh, uh, they competed often successfully with the East India Company. These and other factors affected, you know, the, the, the structural differences between the, the two diasporas affected the respective business organization, so much so that the enterprise form employed by Jalfan Armenians different markedly from the enterprise forms used by Sephardic merchants based in Western Europe. Why the European Sephardim recruited commission agents among both Jews and non-Jews, Jalfan Armenians relied almost exclusively on traveling agents to conduct their business abroad, but they also integrated more easily in the society where they put roots. The roots, this is, I'm not going to details, but it's very important. I mean, the, the way to do business, it's always um, uh, connected to, to larger um, cultural and institutional sets of developments. But in fact, um, there, the, they, there, there is not one model of trade diaspora. Rather than concluding that such variety should lead us to discard the concept of trade diaspora altogether, I suggested that we build new taxonomies and new questions starting from the richness of these granular comparisons. And this is in an introduction that I wrote to this book that I co-edited with um, two colleagues, 
uh, that is followed by a number of uh, interesting, very interesting uh, collection of essays. The implication of such a procedure are not trivial for global history. And this is what we try to show in this book in which we, I try to build a taxonomy of questions and then a number of specific empirical studies. In the wake, and this is an example of what I think should not be done. I don't know the author, so I hope you won't be offended by my comments. In the wake of Curtin's work, some scholars have sought to downplay the differences between Asian traders and their European counterparts in an effort to contest the supposed inferiorities of Asian traders. Completely agree with this goal, but how to do it? So this is a study of a powerful 17th century Chinese family of merchants and military readers. It makes the case for this family's historical importance by way of an analogy with the Dutch. Xing Hong, the author, maintains that, quote, the differences between the Zheng, which is the name of the family, and the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, largely cancel each other out, enabling a rough framework of comparisons between the two entities to be established. These are his words. But later in the same studies, he concludes that, again, his, his words, a, weak, a weakness of the Zheng lay in their relative disadvantage to the superior ships, weaponry, and fortress design of the Dutch East India Company and other Western colonial enterprises. Reading the latter statement, one is inevitably left wondering what was the initial intent of the analogy. They were not analogous. So why making an analogy when there is no analogy? You just defeat your own purposes. A more fruitful global framework I've proposed in a co-author article would be to dethrone the European charter joint stock companies such as the VOC from their presumed exemplarity following the great divergence literature of, globe, of, of balance comparisons you know, and identify the reasons for dissimilarities and differences between enterprise forms that can be found found across Eurasia in the late medieval and early modern periods. The VOC had ships and fortresses and the you know, Zheng family did not. Why? Not that because one is superior and one is inferior. Uh, you, so this line of research remains in its infancy, but we believe that it holds a great potential. Pursuing an alternative, but no less rewarding approach in which I detect an echo of Ginsburg's morphology. Simona Cerutti, a social historian of early modern Italy and also close to the microhistorical project, and Isabel Grango, a scholar of Ottoman North Africa, have realized, have, have revitalized yet another form of comparative history. In concert with the accent on specificity in the recent comparative literature on the Great Divergence, but departing from the great divergence literature dependency from secondary sources and directly challenging both post-colonial scholars and advocates of connected history, Ceruti and Grango argue for the possibility of building comparisons starting from the analysis of original records produced by early modern institutions and society that were not in direct contact with one another. Their examples focus on continental European and North Africa Ottoman repositories of documents attesting to the allocation of properties at the death of hairless or poor individuals. Their revisionist findings show the theoretical, show the theoretical and, and empirical possibility of reconciling an emphasis on locality with a broad comparative perspective. Recent warnings of global history imminent expiration date were likely premature. In fact, we may worry less about global history running out of steam than about its survival in the absence of a candid reckoning with its fuzzy meanings and manifold ambitions, as well as its limits. At present, it would seem that publisher, 
deans, and even some politician shape its contours many more than any individual scholars or disciplinary constituencies. For this reason alone, we cannot separate easily the real life politics, the academic policy, and the more scholarly debates associated with the past, the present, and future of global history. For some colleagues in the field of early modern European history, tackling the politics of global history is to confront head on some of the pressing issues of our time concerning the legacy of the slave, the, At the Atlantic slave trade, whether with regard to reparations, museum curatorial choices and restitution, or the public display of figures involved in past horrors. Naturally, each and every one of these issues raises questions about the relationship between the past and the present and the forms of analogical, analogical thinking that underpin this relationship. Other colleagues prefer to conduct their battles within the academy, where a global approach can help dislodge ingrained practices of historical and institutionalized discrimination. The question then becomes whether radical politics correspond to methodological inventiveness and why we assume that the two might go hand in hand. A global perspective has so far not necessarily implied a methodological retooling. Global history is a theme more often than it is a paradigm, nor I think we should be surprised. A number of fields in the humanities have fought for the inclusion of marginalized subjects, including in African-American, Latinx, ethnic, and LGBTQ studies by utilizing very traditional tools of social history. Conversely, some of the most profound methodological renewals in the historical profession of the past decades have been unrelated to the global terms. Sorry. What have I done? I'm here. As of 2008, for example, John Scott, 1986, Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis, remained the most frequently viewed and the most frequently printed of the articles published in the American Historical or downloaded, I don't know how they know it's printed. Uh, of the articles in the American Historical Review. Admittedly, it was already in 1989 that Kimberly Crenshaw published a pathbreaking article on intersectionality, a concept that only recently has gained currency and found particularly fertile ground in studies of colonial and post-colonial context. The relationship between micro and macro scales of analysis this, a topic on which I concentrated, is a vital concern here because it animates important projects associated with global history and yet has been at the heart of many consequential historical and sociological approaches long before the global turn as we know it today appeared on the horizon. In 1939, Norbert Elias sought to link the introduction of the fork and new table manners in 15th century Europe to the ultimate macro phenomena, state building, the process of state building. Imperfect as all grand theories and today obviously very dated, Elias's remains one of the most brilliant combination of the micro and the macro scales and the psychological and the sociological framework. And it was also an intentionally Eurocentric project. My premise throughout this paper has been that although micro and macro analytical categories are not synonyms of local and global scales, their intersections becomes even less self-evident as we broaden the range of actors, institutions, languages, environments, religions, and cultures that we encompass in our research. If we take a global history to mean at the minimum, a less Eurocentered perspective, we ought to clarify how existing modalities of combining micro and macro analysis meet new challenges. In his 1976 inaugural lectures to the Collège de France, 
I think it's interesting, 1976 is also the year when the Cheese of the Worm and the Worms was published. That's maybe just a coincidence and maybe not. But in, the, uh, in this lecture, Paul then reflected on the possibilities of drawing comparisons between the ancient Roman Empire, which was his area of expertise, and other empires in world histories, as well as on the range of theoretical paradigms available to conduct such comparisons. He criticized historians for being content with cataloging differences and for their obsession with the degree of completeness of their inventories of differences, the expression that gave the title to his lectures. At the same time, then uh, also reiterate, reiterated the analytical, not just merely descriptive value of identifying the peculiarities of any given historical phenomenon. To do so, he noted, can be and is a tool of critique of top-down classificatory taxonomies and the stepping stone for a more genuine comparative approach. By stressing this ostensible tension, Vain was merely reaffirming history's status as an interpretive discipline of particularities and generalities, both of which exist in dialectic relationship with one another. I'm aware that to close this paper by evoking the work of an eminent male historian of ancient Rome speaking from a citadel of academic privilege in the heart of Paris may appear as a provocation. I do so in order to make plain my insistence on the need to assess similarities and differences on both a historical and a historiographical level. As we revisit the contribution of microanalytical perspective to global history, we find that there is, of course, more than one way of integrating micro and macro scales of analysis. In turn, to inquire into these different forms of microanalysis and global comparisons, bring us to evaluate their import at the onset of the 21st century. And as we do so, we cannot but ask ourselves, how can we depart from prior engagements with these problems that have so long preoccupied scholars before us. So thank you very much. And your perspective from a different academic world is very valuable to me. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Grazie mille Francesca per il tuo tempo e per la tua lezione. Francesca, ti farò adesso alcune domande e poi passo a Carla Miucci e dopo alle domande delle, eh, degli studenti. Va bene? Va bene, molto bene. Carla tradurrà le domande degli studenti in italiano, ma puoi rispondere in inglese. Oh, oh, I, I may be able to understand, I mean, I usually can understand the Brazilian Portuguese because you guys understand, you speak uh, very clearly. Ok. <laughs> Francesca, eh, Parlo italiano o portoghese? You can speak Portuguese. If I don't understand, I'll ask you. Ok. Francesca, uh, eu concordo contigo quando você afirma que a história global não é um paradigma, no sentido dado ao termo pelo Thomas Kuhn. Mais do que isso, uh, a história global é um termo de difícil definição. Temos desde análises mais tradicionais, imperialistas, eurocêntricas, até trabalhos magníficos como os de Sanjay Subramanian. Uh, eu gostaria, então, em primeiro lugar, de perguntar, que você explicasse, sobretudo para os alunos que estão nos assistindo, o que, que diferencia a atual história global das antigas histórias brodelianas, dos anos 40 e 60. Quais tipos de história global são mais promissoras atualmente para não cairmos nos mesmos erros generalizantes realizados pela historiografia passada? Tenho mais duas perguntas. Duas demandas. Segundo a sua perspectiva, 
qual seria a melhor maneira de inserirmos elementos sincrônicos nas abordagens globais, cuja maioria das pesquisas ocorrem apenas numa dimensão diacrônica? A análise de trajetórias globais é suficiente para essa questão? E, por fim, em um debate recente com o Carlo Ginsburg, você apresentou, e apresentou aqui hoje também, a hipótese de que o livro História Noturna pode ser considerado retrospectivamente como uma obra de história global. Argumento que eu concordo, mas eu acredito também que é mais uma radicalização, por assim dizer, do projeto microanalítico realizado pelo Ginsburg. De qualquer maneira, eu gostaria que você explicasse de uma forma mais detalhada de que forma a microhistória praticada por Leve, Ginsburg ou mesmo Eduardo Grande, que escreveu muitas coisas que relacionam o local com algo mais amplo, poderiam nos ajudar a produzir histórias conectadas. Well, David, you asked me um, three small questions, so. <laughs> Generale, né? <laughs> yeah, we have to we have to leave some time for others. Um, I am not uh, known for being uh, short. You can resume. Head, you so can resume. No problem. Let, let me try. Uh, Brodel is an important uh, question. It's an important point. Um, let me try to be brief. Um, there are two Brodels. Um, there is Brodel of the Mediterranean which was first published in 49, famously revised, uh, but first written apparently during the year when he was a French officer in captivity in a German prison camp. Um, and uh, the Bradell of the three volumes on the history of capitalism, which is where he has more global, as yeah. we understand it now, uh, uh, aspiration. But I would like to call attention to uh, the Bradell of the Mediterranean for two reasons. Uh, that is a book that, um, well, it's very long, it's 1300 pages. It's a book that is uh, at least uh, in, in North America. I don't know, it will be interesting in, in, to know um, in Brazil. Uh, people think they know the book, but it's not very read. Um, I, in my 14 years at Yale, I had developed a technique To, to teach that book in one week. Uh, that's the only thing <laughs> I am proud of, the only thing I accomplished in 14 years. Um, and it's different when you read it than when you think you, you know it. Um, the book is a book about the Mediterranean, which is written only with sources from the European Mediterranean and has an argument about, which attempts to encompass North Africa and the Ottoman Empire. It has mostly Spanish and Venetian sources. Yeah. Um, Bradell had as a, as a younger man, as many uh, earlier um, um, of his generation spent time as a teacher in, a, in, colonial, in French colonial Algeria, but in his generation, he had not learned Arabic. Um, he had a lot of influence among Ottoman <clears throat> Ottomanists and some of them Turkish, but no, there is not a Turkish Ottoman version of the Mediterranean. Um, so it is the, the epitome in some ways of the Eurocentric you know, global uh, history, but it is a product of his time. Okay. So I, I'm somebody who I don't think we should fault, you know, the, the, the scholars of that generation. We should just not replicate those mistakes today. You know, our, um, um, it's, it's too bad that there isn't an, an, Ottoman res an Ottomanist response uh, to Bradell. Um, but uh, when we write new, global histories with those ambitions for those who like to write that kind of work. To, in, we cannot write in 2020 a, a book of that kind. Uh, what I always want to emphasize, I cannot miss the occasion, is Bradell's central concept, the longue durée, is a new um, concept of time, which is a pre-industrial time. 
for reasons that are very peculiar, in English, long durée means many centuries. Mm. But in Brodel, long durée means a cyclical time that is specific to a period before the Industrial Revolution when technology is unable to disrupt the cyclicality and the seasonality of time because of the, it's not a completely passive, you know, passivity of, of human society to the environment, but because of the limited ability of human technology to alter the environment. Uh, so he has the famous chapter on transhumans um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the beginning of the book. Um, so there are very important concepts for historians of early modern uh, period in Brudel. I think that when we think of this early modernity as a 1500, 1800 chronology that, that I invoked, is it possible to use that chronology to work across periods? Mm -hmm. Maybe a different chronology to work across uh, Eurasia. Well, the long durée, is one concept that Brodel put forth for scholars to think about. In fact, from antiquity, his idea is that there is a pre-industrial time for all societies. You can include Africa, you can include uh, pre-settler um, colonialism uh, uh, Americas uh, because humans, all human societies alter the relationship with the environment, um, but there, you know, there, there's, there's limited ability to do so before a, a society goes through the industrial revolution. So I think there's a there there's more to Brodel. There are limits, and yes, there are more to Brodel. Obviously, there's more. You know, there, there's a chapter in which he writes the. The Mediterranean civilization is the Baroque, okay? <laughs> so obviously it's patently Eurocentric, right? Because the, the, you know, what does the Ottoman Empire, what are these Morocco, it's not part of the, you know, the kingdom of Morocco, what does it have to do with the, with the Baroque? What is Morocco, right? Uh, but that's a product of his time. Okay. The synchronic element, um, well, you have uh, been a, a little too generous with my work, so I hesitate here, um, but obviously this is what I uh, try to do, you know, in part because I study one uh, partnership in my work, one, one uh, trading partnership, but in part because, uh, be, you know, being influenced by microhistory, I, you know, borrowed a lot from uh, anthropology and, uh, that is sort of the tension, you know, the, 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 the when uh, you kindly mentioned that my uh, book on Livorno was translated into French, and it was interesting because the French did not understood it particularly as a global microhistory as, as the English one. And they really liked the chapter on, um, on the family, which is the most uh, uh, anthropological of, of my chapters, because that is the way in which microhistory, that's the form of Italian microhistory that migrated to French. And that's another example, which I think is fascinating of how global history has incredibly different national variations, uh, which is why I'm eager to hear all of your uh, comments. And I think that is one of the most uh, fascinating paradoxes. Um, and uh, that's why I think Zoom is helping all of us to be you know, to learn from each other because uh, um, the world is not flat. And even those of us who, you know, have the ability to read, uh, <clears throat> you know, work across the national uh, frontiers and to more or less under understand each other's uh, through English and through some linguistic understanding, we are still very shaped by our um, academic, national academic traditions. Uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, um, that's what I was trying to do in my work is by showing that uh, um, if we study uh, the history of commerce 
always in an evolutionary form. How do you go from the commander to the charter company? You know, um, you actually miss a lot. And it, in order to understand how certain forms of business organization worked, you have to put, you know, Jews and Armenians and ideally, and, and Aslanian puts uh, Multanis, which are some um, Central Asian uh, groups and other groups next to each other. You have to do that synchronically. And there's a lot you gain and, and, and you see there are similarities and differences and why. Um, so there, there's a richness that comes from, from that synchronic comparison. And lastly, I, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this because maybe we can talk about it in May. Uh, but uh, the question of uh, Ginsburg uh, um, Storia Notturna, it fascinates me. So um, Davy generously uh, refers to a conversation. I mean, I, I interviewed Ginsburg and uh, um, there is a um, <clears throat> document online because uh, I was surprised. I asked him, uh, are you comfortable with uh, um, us referring to Storia Notturna retrospectively, I said, I asked him, it didn't exist, uh, the, this notion of global history didn't exist when you published, or at least was not, you know, a kind of a point of reference when you wrote it. Uh, would you be comfortable if we call it today a global microhistory? And he said, yes, and I was surprised. I thought he would have said no. I was happy he said yes, um, because I think it's a much better global micro history than others. <laughs> um, and I think that um, in some ways we, we find, not now that he allows us to call it that way, um, we have a sort of a, an original prototype. <laughs> um, and also it allows us to explore. I also think it's sort of, it allows us to be a little more playful, you know, um, but, um, but I do think that it, it is important to just, to, to see that there was a true, I mean, I think that book is very difficult, but it, it is, the product of such great attempt of experimenting. And so I think that it allows us to bring a book that in my view is not being discussed enough. And this uh, new etiquette, this, this label, which is now trendy, allow, perhaps allows us to bring back the attention to a book that is difficult. You can assign the cheese and the worms this, you know, to undergraduate. You can't assign, I think, you know, Storia Notturna to undergraduates, but I just, you know, I've taught that Storia Notturna to undergraduates is difficult. Excuse me, to, 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 to graduate them, to doctoral students is difficult. But once we say this is, Maybe, maybe this is the earliest experiment of, with global history by an Italian my, uh, microhistorian. Maybe there's a little more of a hook. Um, and I think it is important that we discuss that book because uh, I don't, you know, I, I think that, that it needs to be discussed uh, and, and reread. And it, it is, um, you know, it is important to if we want to continue to discuss the relationship between microanalysis and global history, we can also decide that we can table the conversation. But if we want to discuss, if we want to continue that conversation, I was surprised for many years that we continue to sidestep that book, uh, which was the elephant in the room. Yeah. And so I think that uh, he gave us sort of permission to put a label that uh, um, would, uh, you know, make it easier to bring some limelight to, to what seemed to me, um, you know, impossible to sidestep uh, if we want to if we want to have that conversation. Cool. Antes de passar a palavra para a professora Carla, tem uma pergunta do professor Alexandre que está com a gente. 
sobre a questão do conceito de tempo em Brodel. Hum. Ele colocou aí a última pergunta no bate-papo do... Você consegue ler? O que é que eu fale para você? Uh, yeah, I'm reading. Ok. Depois eu vou ler para os nossos... Para quem está assistindo, para eles saberem. Hum. Yeah, I think that, um... Deixa só, Francesca, deixa só uh, ler, a, ler a pergunta em português para quem está no YouTube poder saber. Ah, uh, you should read it in Portuguese. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not going to read it in Portuguese. Então, aproveitando a reflexão, é uma pergunta do professor Alexandre Avelar. Aproveitando a reflexão da Francesca sobre o conceito de tempo em Brodel, gostaria que ela explorasse justamente os desafios que as transformações nas nossas percepções sobre o tempo histórico lançam para o projeto renovado de histórias conectadas. Em outras palavras, como conciliar distintas percepções sobre o tempo históricos, sobre os tempos históricos, né, vindo de várias sociedades, e um projeto uh, intelectual ambicioso e importante como o da história global. I think this is a very good, very very good question. I um this question of temporalities um I don't, I could be, I don't think it's probably discussed as much as it should. I mean, obviously we know that there are different societies that have, um, this is another question that I actually asked uh, Carla Ginsburg in that, in, that, uh, in that interview, because uh, he has an essay in which um, he argues that his historical perspective in terms of the notion of distance in uh, Western culture derives from an Augustinian root. Um, but, and I asked him, you know, but it was toward the end, you know, but as we do global history, if we assume that all society have a notion of, 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 of historical distance, what do we do with that? Um, but it is, it is more complicated, maybe not all societies have or have developed the same a notion of historical distance. I mean, certainly um, certain society have a very different notion of um, in their religious practices to notion of time than in their notion of, um, of historical artistic conservation, what needs to be restored to the original, what needs to be rebuilt um, you know, by, and, and change and updated uh, even today. Um, so I think that there, there are a lot of uh, um, issues that perhaps a few intellectual historians devote to some uh, writing to questions of temporality, but I would say that this absolutely crucial question has not enter the mainstream of global and connected history reflections as much as you should. That's my impression. I, I don't know, uh, maybe Alexander can tell me if I'm missing something. Um, the, however crude, the tripartite um, uh, classification of Brodel was certainly part of a extraordinary um, attempt to bring a reflection on the plurality of notions of time into the mainstream. I mean, during the interwar period, at least, you know, in Europe, there are all sorts of conceptions of time as nonlinear in, in the novel in psychoanalysis. I mean, everything about time uh, explodes in European culture. Um, and so Bradell, you know, whether indirectly or directly influence um, You know, I mean, you can rejoice for Freud without uh, um, without having a sense of that. Um, but it 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 becomes mainstream, you know, because then everything is in three parts. And uh, and um, but but there, then then somehow this history, the reflection and temporality has become something on which intellectual historians write, and then more not 
you know, social historians don't think about it, why Brodell did. And I, so I, I think it's a big problem that you put your fingers on, on something that uh, we should not take it for granted and, um, and do more about it. So thank you for raising this point. Francesco, eu vou passar então a palavra para a professora Carla, que vai fazer algumas perguntas. Obrigada. E também vai ler algumas perguntas dos alunos lá no YouTube, porque eu estou sem acesso ao YouTube aqui. Ok. okay. okay. Buonasera, Francesca. Salve. Bem-vinda. Volho salutarla e ringraziarla per aver aceto, aceitato o convite para estar aqui hoje na classe inaugural do curso pós-laurea de História da Universidade Federal de Berlândia. É um honor eh, conhecer um pouco da tu, tua recerca, do teu trabalho. E... Há duas perguntas para ti e depois a outra três de Vivielo. Então, a primeira pergunta é sobre o último livro eh, familiaridade entre estranhos, a diáspora sefarita, Livorno e o comércio transcultural eh, da Idade Média. Eh, lì, eh, lei ha cercato di mettere insieme analisi del, nel piano simbolico e sociale, mettendo alle spalle eh, la guerra tra queste due prospettive di analisi, eh, presentando almeno tre perspectiva, tre piano di analisi di storia sociale, storia dell'immaginario cristiano e trasmissione intertestuale. Eh, secondo te, qual è l'importanza di questo tipo di analisi nella ricerca che, che cerca un'interpretazione, una, un rapporto tra micro e la macro storia o storia globale? Eh, questa è, è una domanda, né? volevo che, che parlasse un po' di questo processo di lavoro con questi queste due approcci. E, e l'altra eh, domanda eh, è un po' più generale, né? E, vorrei che tu parlassi un po' sull'incontro tra micro storie e storia globale, considerando... Eh, allora i dibattiti sul rapporto tra scale e differenti concezioni di spazi e contesti nella nascita di un nuovo percorso di ricerca e innovativi eh, interpretazioni del passato. Questo è un po' più generale. E dopo ci sono più due domande eh, del Jonathan Eliel. Eh, Francesca, lei ha detto che la storia globale non può essere considerata un paradigma eh, e la domanda è perché non si può considerare un paradigma e lei non pensa che possa essere un paradigma nel futuro? Questa è una domanda di... De... E poi l'altra di Pedro, professoressa Francesca, grazie per il colloquio. Il mio dubbio è sul lavoro con le documentazioni usate nella ricerca della micro e della macro storia e come si fa per equalizzare o per pareggiare, non lo so, le oggettivi di gruppi di interessi diversi quando gli interessi del piano micro non vanno con quegli interessi del piano macro? Eh, questa è la domanda. Eh, L'altra... Ah, de Alexandre, Alexandre, eh, it's okay for, eh, for you? Yeah, okay. Eh, e l'ultima è così. Vorrei che commentassi un po' come avviene l'approccio agli approcci tra teorici dell'arte, come per esempio l'autore Walter Benjamin, eh, Auerbach, e la costruzione della relazione tra micro e macro storia globale. Eh, forse ok, soltanto queste grazie mille ok um... a lot of things <laughs> grazie uh, Carla, thank you so I think uh, your first question really um, I'm going to sp spend a little bit of time um, refers to my latest book which 
is called uh, the promise and peril of, of credit rather than my study of, of trade. Um, and um, I wanna say a couple of things about it. This is a book that is um, only about Europe. Um, not because I don't believe in, in global history, but um, aside from having lost my ability to, to, to speak Portuguese, I um, have either active or passive knowledge of only European languages. And I think that uh, uh, at Yale, I had the fortune of working with extraordinary doctoral students who are younger and have really the ability to work in both European and non-European archives that I don't have. And this begins to answer, do I think that there may be a paradigm of global history in the future? Yes, I have no idea with what the future is, but I think, um, I don't know what I think. I think, I hope that if there is a paradigm of, you know, no paradigm is perfect and that's why there, you know, every, every paradigm is then replaced. You know, the, the consensus, yeah. there is one consensus and then the scholarly community fights over it, keeps that consensus and then revoke it. So, but if there's gonna be a, one homeostasis of one consensus for some time, uh, before I die, I would like that paradigm to be one forged by a younger generation than me that writes global history doing what before COVID used to be called multi-archive, multilingual global history. Now that enterprise is also extremely expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I'm not insensitive to this. I did, uh, I did my second PhD in the poor of the US Ivy Leagues. Brown is an Ivy League without a law school and without a medical, excuse me, and without a business school, which means that it's alumni don't, are poor. They do fantastic documentary movies and things, but they, they don't have the rich alumni that then give money. So I did not have a fellowship I had to you know, had to work and, you know, I, I mean, I was incredibly privileged. That's what I mean, you know, to be in the poor of the Ivy League, I couldn't go to Goa, okay? Only when I arrived and even richer Ivy League, okay? So I'm saying that I have been so privileged in my life, okay? When I used to teach at the University of Venice, I did not have enough money to go to Livorno. I mean, like, this is an expensive business we're in and I think I am... I see many of you going like this, and I'm extremely sensitive to this. Now the international um, borders are closed and doctoral students who have a deadline, um, younger, younger faculty who have a deadline for their um, tenure dossiers, how do you write these ambitious global yeah. histories? Okay, so this is when I say that global history is also in the hands of the deans. I'm talking about very, very serious things about which incentives are there. Now we're always um, hearing about certain, uh, you know, lofty words, uh, but then it's only those of us who win the lottery. And after we have won the lottery many times that, um, so, but I, I think that I, want to encourage and do everything possible when I find myself in certain positions to help uh, younger scholars who are producing the kind of innovative uh, global history methodologically and empirically that I value the most. I personally don't think I have the uh, linguistic and training abilities to produce the best work in global history. Yeah. I think I can still do a, some interesting things, but in the old continent. So I, 
thought that the, and I, this is a bit of a departure, but I think that there are other areas where there's still questions about innovations that remains to be explored for historians. As Carla said, you know, I think that, and we've never met, but generationally, maybe we're not so far apart. You know, some of us remember the history wars that our teachers fought between, uh, you know, uh, social history and cultural histories. And they really wanted us to take sides. Sometimes we had to, but they never really, you know, I, I could sleep, I could let them fight. It, they didn't keep me up at night. And then when I started teaching graduate students, they really did not even understand, you know, I would teach two books that they would be on the opposite side of the cultural wards and they would both, they like both books. And I would say, you can't. I say, what do you mean you can't? You can't because the authors would not want to, you to like both books. And then I understood, okay, we, we need to do something new. We need to, we need, and I, in this book in which I, I think I, my frustration as was not able to arrive at delineating a general method. And so I thought I, I would publish it even before, otherwise I would never finish. I decided you have an expression in English, I would just, you know, it's my kitchen sink. You know, I, I'll tell you how I do it. Even I don't know how to give you a method to replicate it. But with this particular object, I've tried, you know, the, the topic, it's really, how do you write a social history of economic abstraction in the 17th and 18th century? How do you bring the history of economic lives and the history of economic imaginary together? Yes. And um, this, I think, I think remains a question for those of us who are historian of Europe, uh, perhaps in other areas of the world. Um, and this is where I thought I might have a little bit to contribute. If I become, I cannot be a very original historian of the Mediterranean because I don't have more languages than Brodel. Okay, so, um, so yes, there may be a, a paradigm, but I think the paradigm is not, it will be one that has to include the ability or, the, or, or you know, with its limits or, or co-authorship, you know, or, or something that is different from the conventional synthesis or, or, or that, uh, that exists today. Now the question about uh, geogra the, the question of scale and space. And this is something that um, uh, an Italian colleague, um, Angelo Torre, um, who's a very uh, generous person, kindly reproached me not to have explored in my book of Livorno, puts my book on Livorno together with those micro histories that are biographical in genre uh, and do not conceptualize the space. Um, he's right, and yet I think that it, it maybe is obviously it's my mistake. Um, I don't, I don't uh, disagree, obviously readers pick up on, on what an author is not fully able to articulate. Although, I mean, the book is, in many ways about space because it is about the challenge that, as I was saying earlier, in the world of the long durée, what does it mean to be in Livorno waiting for a letter that takes a year and a half to arrive and another year and a half to return from Goa? What does it mean, the fact that you are sending a letter in Portuguese, which at this point in Livorno, this is a 1704 when the, the partnership is created. Uh, this partnership is created by the descendants of Maranos, so-called Maranos has fled uh, uh, Portugal sometime, and um, it's unclear, but sometime 
in uh, um, late 16th, early 17th century. They've been in, Portu in, in, in Livorno for some time. By the way, they write Portuguese, they've learned it phonetically, okay? They've never, they've, they can, there's no school where they, you know, they hear it, you know, they're, you know, my Portuguese is kind of, that's why they, I can read it. You know, it's very Italianized, the, the verbal declensions, you know, they, they put the accent on the, on the final, you know, the, the, the past person, per, the past tense, it's all Italianized. They write, they, they know the distinction when they write to certain Jews who are more Spanish-like, they write more Spanish. They understand the difference between Spanish and Portuguese, they, you know, but they, it's all phonetic, um, the way they write Portuguese. So they write to these Italian intermediaries in Italian, they fold the letter in Portuguese. For, they write to these in Hindus in India whom they've never met, to whom they've been introduced the carrera goes around, it takes about three years when all goes well, when no ships is lost. So there is a concept of space, you know, that I've tried to articulate. The letters between Livorno and Venice goes back like this. That's why there are a lot of letters because there is the courier service. You don't quite pay a stamp by the 18th century, but almost. The Livorno, Florence goes back and forth. Florence, Venice goes back and forth. So there is a sense it's not, you know, uh, there's a sense in which it's very Bradellian, as Bradell said, measure, you know, that space is the, you know, measures the enemy of, of the century, right? It, it, this is, the, the, and so, so the scale, and it's not just, um, it's not just the, 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 the number of kilometers or miles, is that you have to, two things. Once you have to go around the Cape of Good Hope, which is not trivial, and second, these letters are written with a pseudonym. You cannot, as a Jew from Livorno, sign with the name Manuel or, you know, or, or the name, excuse me, with the name Abram or the name, uh, you know, they're all written with a pseudonym, which was legal because it was legal in Tuscany. They said, fine, you have two names, you have a name for the, the lands where there's inquisition, okay? But they signing with a pseudonym. So they go to a notary and say, everything sent to the Portuguese empire under name X means under name Y because they're property rights. So, so there's, a, there's a fragility, there's an, you know, there, so, so the book tries very hard, I thought, um, to make sense of this, uh, fragility of jurisdiction, fragility of, of geographical space that are not separable um, because in the 1740s, according to specialists of the Inquisition, there is the most severe persecution of Maranos in Portugal. The largest, biggest expulsions occurred in the 1740s, which is when then, uh, um, so they don't have any agents who is a new Christian in Portugal. Um, so the last two questions are um, bordering on the impossible. Um, how to reconcile when the data on the micro and the macro don't, uh, don't mix. And that, that's what the all social scientists and historians do. Um, I can uh, just put a little plug um, I can send a copy to, to Brazil. Um, I co-founded a new journal called Capitalism, uh, a journal of history and economics. It's also online, but I'll send uh, um, a copy, a uh, hard copy for your library. And in the next issue, there is a, a, a fantastic essay um, uh, by Emma Rothschild called Where is Capital? In which she... Um, borrows from some recent uh, economics theories about how to use microeconomics to challenge and build new macroeconomic theories. Uh, the question is, how do you do it theoretically? That is with numbers. And then how historians, when you go into the archives and you find you know, a little bit of evidence about one plantation uh, one, uh, you know, number of slaves, productivity, you have one case, 
How do you go from that plantation to a history of relationship between slavery and economic growth in Brazil? Okay, so uh, the, this is, this is uh, um, there is no one solution, but I think it is one of the central questions across the humanities and the social sciences. And one of the most important things we can do today is to continue this dialogue between the humanities and the social scientists, knowing that um, it is a very difficult dialogue, but we're having it. Um, Art historians are part uh, of the humanities. They often are the most humanistic of, of, of these uh, scientists, of the, of the humanities. Um, I mean, obviously you're, you're invoking uh, uh, two who were part of thinking about a European modernity. I mean, Davy has written about these figures and, and uh, their role in this. Um, but um, I mean, these are all, this is the way I, you know, they, they're the generation of Norbert Elias, right? And it's a different moment. This is a, you know, we have to remember that in, in these, there was a moment in which for most of our points of references as scholars of Europe, the question was, what is European modernity and its discontents, right? Especially for those who, I mean, Eric Auerbach writes in exile from Nazi Germany in Istanbul. Walter Benjamin commits suicide thinking he would never be able to make it onto the ship, uh, although he probably would have made it onto the ship. So they're haunted by something that was the most horrible manifestation of European modernity. Um, and so that is a very important question because how do we write that moment, which for so long has been a central question in post-enlightenment Europe into this new history, into this new global history. Um, but it's not easy to, to, to answer this question because they're, they're very different genealogies, this kind of, uh, but I do think that it's important to bring this genealogy into conversation so as not to forget, you know, so it's not just to start with global history as if this other genealogy were not so central to the way in which history writing in Europe has been developed. I'll stop here. Muito okay. obrigado, Francesca, pelo seu tempo, pelas respostas, pela excelente aula. Foi um prazer ter você com a gente aqui hoje e espero que a gente possa conversar mais vezes. Absolutamente. Tchau, obrigada. Obrigada, Francesca. Obrigada a você. Muito obrigada, Francesca. Foi um prazer recebê-la. Acho que foi uma ótima maneira da gente inaugurar o ano letivo do programa de pós-graduação em História na UF. Muito obrigada pela brilhante Good luck palestra. Good to everybody. Tchau. Tchau, tchau. Obrigado.